The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Good morning and welcome to worship here today at Pleasantville Presbyterian Church this 20th Sunday after Pentecost. If you are joining us through YouTube, we'd love to have you say hello in the comments. Here are now these opening sentences of scripture from the Gospel of Mark. How can a mortal receive eternal life? For God, all things are possible. Let us pray. Merciful God, in Jesus Christ, you do not call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Draw us away from the easy road that leads to destruction and guide us into paths that lead into life abundant, that in seeking your truth and obeying your will, we may know the joy of being a disciple of Jesus Christ our Savior, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Come, let us worship our living God. The proof of God's amazing love is this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Because we have faith in him, we dare to approach God with confidence. In faith and penitence, let us confess our sins before God and one another. Please join me. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us amend what we are and direct what we shall be, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Hear now these words of pardon. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. I declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Since God has so forgiven us in Christ, let us also forgive one another. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Peace to everybody. May the peace be with you. May the peace be with you. 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 Peace be with you.
Peace be with you, everyone. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Woo! <laughs> I appreciate that. Good morning, church. Today's reading is from Hebrews 4, 12 to 16. Indeed, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing until it divides soul from spirit, joints from marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And before him no creature is hidden, but all are naked and laid bare to the eyes of the one to whom we must render an account. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who in every respect has been tested as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness, so that we may receive mercy and find grace and help in a time of need. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Have you ever looked into your backpack only to find out you don't have everything you need? You look in the pocket that you think it was supposed to be in and all the other pockets as well and it's, it's not there. That can be, that can be really stressful. And if we don't have everything you need, I wonder what do you do? Maybe, maybe we pretend that we actually have it. What do you mean? Of course I have my scissors. How could I forget that? Or maybe we say, it was probably optional anyways. I don't need it. My own reaction is, to shut down and just not do anything at all. How about you? How would you react? In our gospel story today from the book of Mark chapter 10, we meet a person, the rich young ruler, who didn't have everything he needed. He still lacked one thing, and it wasn't in his backpack. He said to Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life, he said. The problem was, the answer wasn't something he could find in his own backpack. It wasn't anything that he could do. And that frustrated him so much, he, he left. He went away. But you see, no one, nobody is perfect. And there is nothing that you can do to be perfect. But the good news is that Jesus was good enough. Jesus was perfect for you. And Jesus has everything you need. And Jesus is giving that to you today. It is a gift. Let us pray. Loving and gracious Father, Thank you for giving us the gift of your Son, Jesus, in whom we have everything we need. Amen.
words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts, be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Hear now the gospel of our Lord according to St. Mark, the 10th chapter, beginning at the 17th verse. As Jesus was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. He said to him, A teacher, I have kept all these since my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, You lack one thing. Go sell what you have and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When he heard this, he went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus looked around and, and said to his disciples, How hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were perplexed at these words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were greatly astounded and said one to another, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, for mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God all things are possible. Peter began to say to him, Lord, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly I tell you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother, or father or children or fields for my sake and the sake of the gospel, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age, houses, brothers and sisters, mothers and children, fields with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. What is the hardest thing in your life to let go of? It would be really hard for me to let go of coffee. Yes, coffee. Once I was on a new medication and the doctor told me I had to stop drinking coffee. Well, my personality changed. A compassionate friend, not knowing, assumed the worst and asked if there was anything I needed to talk about. Coffee. I just really miss coffee. <laughs> now, I mean, there's certainly something laughable about that anecdote. We all love our coffee, but there is an actual dark side too, and I'm not just talking about the roast. My relationship with coffee had actually changed the way I treated those around me. My friend was right to confront me with both compassion and concern. I love this quote from Tolkien, The Lord of the Rings. Is it not a strange fate that we should suffer so much fear and doubt for so small a thing? risking being melodramatic, I think it gets to the heart of our story today, the story of the rich young ruler. The small things we let rule our fate. The idols our heart creates, thinking that by worshiping them to gain and only realizing far too late that once gave happiness should cause us to suffer. 
This is what idols do, often without us noticing. I didn't realize how coffee had changed me, and there are certainly other idols in my life. I wonder what, what comes to mind for you. What has so taken hold of your life that it is no longer the small thing it once appeared but has grown into an idol in the heart? It may be the hardest thing to let go of. The rich young ruler had made an idol out of wealth. Now there isn't anything intrinsically wrong about money. Jesus and the disciples had money. Recall that Judas kept the coin purse. It was only when money became more than money, an idol of a heart, did it lead to betrayal. I love this painting of the scene by Heinrich Hoffmann, Christ and the Rich Young Ruler. It's at the Riverside Church in New York. I think it interprets the scene well. We see the young man is wealthy by the style of his dress. But beyond that, we see how his wealth has come to define his personhood. He is the main source of light in the painting. The sun itself pales in the background. The poor and unclothed sit hidden in the darkness, unseen and unnoticed. Christ himself, the light of the world, even illumined with a halo, seems muted by comparison, and the young man's eyes, arms, and hand curve back into himself. As Augustine would say regarding sin, we are curvatus in se, curved in upon ourselves. Now this is where the law comes in. Where their Decalogue dialogue awakens the young man, and for an instant, he sees Christ. I think the painting captures one part of the story well. But the image we saw was hard to love. And Christ loved him. Our text speaks about the rich young ruler with a certain tenderness. Many came to question Jesus, Pharisees, Sadducees, and the like, trying to catch Jesus in his words. But there is a genuineness to his question, a real authenticity that I can't help but feel in my heart. Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? It doesn't get any more vulnerable than that. Here he is, a person who had wealth, had authority, and actually tried to be a good person. If only our wealthy today tried to do that. I think this young man actually wanted to know. And I maybe think that he knew it didn't really matter if you had all the money and power in the world, if it's all just for this life. What does it matter? He was here to learn what he had to do to be good enough. Well, Jesus didn't really answer him. I mean, at least not how he expected. It reminds me of a, of a politician who once said to answer the question you wish you had been asked. So, Jesus cuts to the heart of it and says, why do you call me good? No one is good. It's not a matter of being a good person. That never was the point. If we go that way, it ends in despair. That's the despair from the lesson in Job today. If only I could vanish in darkness. That's the cry of the psalmist. But I am a worm. The author of Hebrews knew it well, and before him no creature is hidden, but all are naked and laid bare to the eyes of the one to whom we must render an account. When we are confronted with the brutal honesty of the law, that is the result. 
We too often try to hide its brutality, make nice and pretend. We turn the law into a self-help guide. 613 rules to the good life. We make Moses the lawgiver into a school teacher, Isaiah the prophet into a poet, and Jonah a story about a cute whale. But Jesus doesn't let us get away with that. Jesus loves us too much. And Jesus looked at that young man with love. With love. One thing you lack, Jesus said, one thing. Many suggest this is mere hyperbole, but what if it isn't? What if this person actually did what he said? I know I, I don't, but what if he really did? What if there actually was such a person and they met Jesus? If that really happened, I'm quite glad Mark is telling us the story today. It reminds me of one of my favorite movie scenes. By this time, you know that I watch way too many movies and I'm a huge Marvel nerd. Well, it's a scene between Chris Evans, who plays Captain America, and Chris Hemsworth, who plays Thor. For some reason, all the girls in our youth group seem to love them. I don't know why. Well, so Thor, he has this hammer, Mjolnir, that can only be lifted by whosoever be worthy. They even have this hilarious scene where all the Avengers go around trying to lift it. Maybe Captain America nudges it, you're not sure, but to no avail. Until in the last movie, when all their chips are down, suddenly Captain America lifts the hammer. I remember being in the theaters for that, and it was one of those rare moments when all of a sudden these strangers you didn't even know coalesce into something greater. People were cheery and they wanted to jump out of their seats. It was magical. He was worthy. I tell that story because I think the scriptwriters got it dead right. It certainly resonated with me. And I think there's some version of that story we all tell ourselves. I think it was a version of that story the rich young ruler was telling himself. How can I be worthy? Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? I know I've asked that before. The disciples were probably all nudging each other, saying, finally, somebody asked the question. Maybe you've asked it too. Jesus, Jesus then recites the, the Ten Commandments, and you may know them just as well as that rich young ruler. You shall not. Jesus doesn't even go through them all before he replies, teacher, Teacher, I have kept all these. I think he really may have. Maybe he did. And maybe, I think in this moment, what the young man wanted was Jesus to tell him, you are worthy, you are loved, and you are enough. But Jesus, Jesus loved him too much to say that. Jesus loved him too much to give him what he wanted. Instead, Jesus held up the mirror of the law one more time. One thing you lack. And then the young man finally saw. He finally saw himself, not who he thought he was, not who he wanted to be, but who he really was. And he went away grieved. It is a hard, hard thing to let go of what we love most. But God, God is not satisfied with merely moving aside our idols. God smashes our idols. The disciples, the disciples, they are aghast. 
Here they were thinking Jesus would finally talk simply. Like they've been trying to get him to do all along, and he finally does. But he says this, one thing you lack. Where's the magic? I thought you were finally going to tell us the secret. However, then, can one be worthy? Is nothing ever enough? Mark says, they were greatly astounded and said one to another, then who can be saved? Who indeed? There's a problem. There's a problem, I think, with the, the story we tell ourselves. It's asking the wrong question. It's asking, what must I do? What must I do? You see, I love Captain America, but there's only one of him, and it's a comic book. And in real life, maybe that rich young ruler was as close as anyone got, the closest any of us will ever get to getting it right, keeping the law, being good enough. The sad truth of it is, the law shows each and every one of us in the mirror, there will always be one thing we lack. So what then? Do we all just go home? The young man went away grieved, and I don't blame him. Who then can be saved? The disciples asked. The way, the way to salvation isn't getting better at it. The way to salvation is following Jesus. For mortals it is impossible, Jesus said, but not for God. For God, all things are possible. This is the gospel. Look at what Jesus has done for us. What Jesus has done for you, for you, and for you. It is not what must I do, but what a God, what God has done for you. Jesus did what none of us could do, and Jesus did it for you. Jesus loved us too much to leave things the way they are. Jesus loved us too much just to tell us what we wanted, that you are loved and you are enough. No, Jesus went to the cross and died, and Jesus rose again. So Jesus can say to each and every one of us, you are loved and you are forgiven. You are forgiven. The author of the letter to the Hebrews reminds us, since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness, so that we may receive mercy and find grace. Let us hold fast. This is the promise we can cling to. The law turns us away from ourselves and drives us back to God. We turn from our idols when we follow Jesus. It is Jesus who saves us. If it was a matter of being worthy, then whoever would make it. But if it's a matter of Jesus being worthy, then whosoever believeth in him shall have eternal life. Jesus loves us too much to leave us to ourselves. Jesus loves us too much to let us believe in ourself. Jesus cried out on the cross, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me, so that none may be forsaken? 
what wondrous love is this, O oh my soul. It is the love of God who died for you. It is the love of the God who saved you. It is the love of God who did it all. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. This is the love that will never let you go. Then who can be saved? With God, all things are possible. Amen. I invite you now to join me in praying for the church, the world, and all those in need. Let us pray responsibly, saying, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For your church in every place, that we may worship and serve you faithfully. Lord, in your mercy. For leaders and people in every land, that they may know your will and do your will. Lord, in your mercy. For the earth you have made, that it may flourish in beauty and show your glory, Lord, in your mercy. For all who hunger and thirst, that they may be filled with good things, Lord, in your mercy. For those who are ill or are close to death, that they may know your loving care, Lord, in your mercy. For those who mourn the death of loved ones and grieve the many losses of this year, Lord, in your mercy. Receive all these prayers, O God, in the tenderness of your mighty hand, and strengthen our hands to serve you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now let us pray together in the words our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, now and forever. Amen.
hear now these words of benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Thank you.